as we begin our worship together.
Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here this morning, and uh, what a way to start off our service by uh, praising and exalting the name of Jesus. Uh, we're here to worship the Lord. We're glad that you're here today, and if this is your first time with us, uh, we welcome you. We're glad that you're here, and I uh, hope that on your way in, you receive one of those yellow Connect cards, and uh, if you did, please bring it to the Welcome Center on your way out at the end of the service and uh, leave it there. We have a gift for you and uh, we want to connect with you and we use that throughout the week. And if you're here for more than your first time, we welcome you back and it's always good to be together uh, in, in God's house, amen? amen. I pray that uh, we have a good uh, service today, that uh, God will speak to us, that we'll hear him clearly and that uh, when it comes time for us to make a decision that we'll uh, respond appropriately to what the Lord has for us to do. Thank uh-huh. this moment to share uh, something that has become really important to me. Uh, I have been listening to um, a uh, presentation or a group of presentations by Tony Evans and his family. Um, They lost uh, seven, I think, family members in the last year and a half. And they put together um, a um, DVD or CD set. They wrote a book called Divine Disruption, and they put together this CD set um, of several of Tony's messages um, and, and a 
discussion between he and his four kids. You may know Priscilla Shire. She uh, writes really amazing Bible studies. Anthony Evans is an incredible singer. Um, his son, uh, John, Jonathan, uh, is a, an evangelist. And then he has another daughter, Crystal, and they talk about um, everything that happened. And, and if you suffered any kind of a loss, I really recommend that you find. Uh, go on TonyEvans.com. And no, I don't get a commission for this. Um, but go on TonyEvans.com and take the time uh, to listen uh, to, um, to what they have to say. During this um, uh, sermon that uh, Tony Evans was preaching, he talked about this scripture, Isaiah 40, 31. And he talked about um, several things that he talked about, and I won't take the time to, to delve into them all. But one of the things that he talks about is that in the Hebrew, in this scripture, the word weight actually is the same word as plat, P-L-A-I-T like braid your hair. And all of you ladies that have um, girls, uh, and maybe some of you guys, um, you know what that means. And I have a granddaughter that has ridiculous hair. It's just everywhere. It's thick and it's just everywhere. And if we don't do something with that hair, when she goes out and the wind blows, her hair goes everywhere. It's like the cousin it that you've seen on Adam's family. It's everywhere. But when my daughter sits her down, and plaits her hair, braids it. She takes one piece over the other piece and another piece over that piece and braids her hair. It becomes very strong. She can go out in the wind and nothing moves her hair. And when Tony is talking about this scripture, he says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. I always thought that meant you just get in the line and you sit down and you wait on God to do what he's going to do. But he shared that it means you plat yourself to the Lord. And when you take your life and you intertwine it with the Lord's, it won't move when the winds come. And when the hurricanes hit, it won't move, and it'll be solid, and it'll be straight because we have intertwined our lives with his. And so when, those wind come, when that wind comes, we are, we are stuck with him, and he holds us through those storms. That was such a, an amazing revelation to me. And... Uh, it doesn't mean that you wait until the storm. If you wait until the wind to try to braid Olivia's hair, not going to happen because it's going to be everywhere. But if you braid her hair, if you plait her hair ahead of time, she goes out in the wind, her hair will remain strong and straight. If we plait ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, we intertwine our lives with him all the time. When the winds come, we won't be blown away. We won't be blown from side to side. We'll be strong. And we can count and trust on him to be right there, regardless of the storm that may come.
of your faithfulness to us. Lord, in those moments in our lives when it seems like we're falling apart, may we be reminded that you hold us together because of your life in us, the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. And so, Lord, may our prayer be that our lives would be planted with you, Father, that when the storms come, we're safe in your hands. Father, this morning we ask that you will be honored and lifted up and that you would draw us to yourself. Lord, there may be some here today who have not met you as Savior and Lord. And so, Lord, may this be the day that they would entwine their lives with yours and become your child. And then, Lord, for the rest of us who know you, may we be reminded that we are called to be at work with you because you live in us. And Lord, may we be a testimony of your faithfulness to each of us. And we'll give you thanks for all you will do. And we ask it in Jesus' name.
I hate it when you do that. Hey, fear not, my friend. I bring you good news of... Okay, no news, just coffee. Thanks. Decaf, right? Yep, got you the unleaded stuff. I keep telling you, you gotta cut back on the caffeine. What's the real stuff gonna do? Shorten my lifespan? <laughs> Want me to cut down? I can cut down. Hey, come on, cut it out. Chill, bro. Just having a little fun. What is it with you and these people anyway? What do you mean? I don't know. It just seems like you like them or something. I mean, personally, I don't know what you see in them. I don't know what the boss sees in them. I and mean, they're not exactly the sharpest tools in the shed, right? I'm aware they've had their moments. Still. Oh, haven't you heard the latest? No. Oh. I've been on assignment. Check this out. He wants to become one of them. One of who? You know, them. He does? I know. It's weird, right? So, what? He's gonna become a president or something like that? See, that's, that's the even crazier part, is he's going to come as a, as a baby. He's even got the parents picked out, but no one's special. They're not even married yet. Do you realize that that means that, 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 that he's got to get born? Like a, like a, like a human birth. Have you ever, have you ever seen that? <sighs> Yeah, well, he's always doing stuff you don't expect. You know what? I think it's a bad idea. Coming down as a baby? Doesn't he know what they're like? I mean, who knows what they'll do to him? I bet he's got a plan. He always does. Besides, we won't let anything bad happen to him. You really think they're worth the risk? You can never tell what humans are going to do next. One minute they're like, Oh, save me, Lord, I'll do anything. And the next minute they're sneaking off, going to do the same thing that got them into trouble in the first place. They're, 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 they're so... Oh. I get what you're saying. I do. But you know, as I've watched them, I've seen something. I've seen compassion, joy, a sense of wonder. And yeah, they're broken and messed up and <laughs> they need someone to save them from themselves. So are they worth the risk? I don't know, I guess. But it doesn't really matter what we think. All that really matters is what he thinks. And he thinks they're worth it. Well, Father, We're gathered here again on this Lord's Day 
to worship you and to be reminded that it all started when you decided even before the foundation of the world that you would come and live among us. Who would have ever thought that the Savior of all mankind would come as a babe in a manger than to grow up among folks who were heathens, unbelievers, mockers, and yet you came to be here on this earth that we might become like you are. And so, Father, we thank you this morning for your greatness, that you loved us that much, that you looked down and saw that we needed a Savior, and you came. And so, Lord, this morning we celebrate your birth. We celebrate all that you came to do, that you indeed came to be the wonderful counselor. And so, Lord, this morning, I pray that you would appeal to our hearts anything that we need to share with you. Lord, to seek your forgiveness, to acknowledge your wonderful presence, to acknowledge your greatness, to submit to your care. Lord, may you have your way with us. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I would ask you this morning to turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9. This is the time of year when schedules get full and often things can become hectic as we draw near to Christmas Day. And all of the hustle and the bustle that we find ourselves in, uh, we need to slow down and not miss the reason for this season. We don't want to miss the fact that Jesus the Christ was born into this world. We don't know for sure when he was born into this world. We know that he was. We celebrated on December 25th, and I suppose any day that we would choose to celebrate his birth is okay. But we have chosen down through the years to put it on the calendar as of December 25th. We celebrate because of what God gave us. He gave us himself in the person of a babe in a manger. And so, let's look at Isaiah's prophecy concerning this matter. I want to begin in verse 22 of chapter 8. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Nevertheless, oh, that's an important word. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun, and the land of Nephtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and increase the joy. They rejoice before thee according to the joy and harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of the burden, and the staff of his shoulder 
the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. You'll recall what the day of Midian was. This man by the name of Gideon went forth with a few men <laughs> with clay pots and torches and trumpets and the arm of the Lord was at work in those days. And so he is in this day. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice and with righteousness from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. What a great prophecy Isaiah had concerning our Lord. Israel is facing invasion. So it is shrouded in fearful gloom and utter darkness. The Assyrians are threatening to invade from the north and haul them off into exile and actually... Um, in a few short years from the time of Isaiah's writing, it would occur. Against the backdrop of national despair and gloom, Isaiah envisions two great things. In verses 1 and 2, the dawning of the light of salvation. Goodness gracious, good things are about to happen. Great joy for the people of God. What a wonderful thing Isaiah prophesies. And then we find that God is going to bring about liberation from foreign oppression in verses 4 and 5. The oppressor's yoke will be broken. The promise that the Lord will ultimately bring about a complete cessation of warfare is promised. And how's he going to do that? through the gift of a son, the birth of a child. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. A remarkable answer, one in which we can trust. With what? All of our insecurities, all of our illnesses, all of our heartaches, and all of our sin, the birth of a child. He is the wonderful counselor. This magnificent chapter gives us the prophet's first major exposition of Israel's coming king, the long-awaited Messiah. Isaiah had already hinted at the birth of this world-transforming child in chapter 7 when he wrote, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That is God with us. In chapter 9, Isaiah goes to great length about who this child will be. He uses four names. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Today, we're going to take up the first name given to this child, this Christ, this Savior of the world who is being born. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. <clears throat> when we think about that, what does it mean? Literally a wonder of a counselor, 
or an ex extraordinary counselor, or perhaps a counselor of wonders. If you know the Savior, you have known him as a counselor of wonders in your life. God's plans and purposes ought to fill us with wonder. When we see his plans revealed through this child, we ought to sit back and marvel. He reveals God's wonder-filled wisdom for the world. His plans really become mind-blowing. Who can really understand them or embrace them? What the prophet Isaiah could only see in outline, we now see in full color. This child that is born, this son who is given, is none other than Jesus of Nazareth. This wonderful, wonderful, marvelous counselor, he is coming as savior of the world. What an awesome event when you think about it. When God decided to redeem the world, he chose to unite, as it were, divinity and humanity. Why in the world would God want to come down here and engage with us? Why in the world would he want to come down here and plat his life, if you please, with our life? But that's what he wanted to do. The infinite to take on the finite. Deity to come as a baby. Who would ever come up with that? Oh, Mary, did you know <laughs> that when you kissed your baby, you kissed the face of God? Oh, Mary, did you know? A sovereign and holy God wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Seriously? This is how God comes to man? Think about it. The God of the universe, the creator of all, is going to show up on this earth like a common baby boy lying in a manger. Hmm. No place for a king, you say. But that's how God came. Why do you suppose he came like that? Because he wanted to be one of us. He wanted to experience what folks were experiencing in those days, yet without sin. And so he came. And this is how God chose to redeem the world to himself by becoming like us in every respect except for sin. Would you consider the life of Jesus? He displayed the wisdom of God perfectly in all that he did, not only in his teaching, but how he lived his life. I like what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Do you understand that? Every person that knows Christ as Savior and Lord is rich because we have him living in us. But he gave up it all so that he could come down and intertwine his life with us. Think about his death. The Bible says he died in our place and for our sin, not his sin. The Bible says God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God put upon him judgment so that you and I could receive mercy, the wonderful wisdom of God in salvation. Consider his resurrection. The Bible says he was crucified. He died and he was buried. And there he lay for two whole days and 
till on the third day, against all odds, God triumphed over the grave by raising Jesus from the dead. And so there's hope against hope in the resurrection of Jesus. God defeats death by enduring death and then overcoming it. What Isaiah could only see an outline, we now see with the greater light of salvation. Jesus is the embodiment of God's saving wisdom, and it fills us with unexpected grace. Do you remember the day you received Christ? Do you remember what it felt like to receive that unexpected grace when God lifted from you your sin and took it upon himself and came into your life and began that plaiting of himself with your life. Oh, the angels were astonished at God's wonderful counseling. It's no wonder that whenever we find an announcement that they make about Jesus' birth in the Gospels, how we find them singing their hearts out at what God had done. It's only almost unimaginable that God would show up in such a way as a babe in a manger. It's interesting that God gave Isaiah the insight to know that this baby boy would be the wonderful counselor. He would be. One thing is for sure, in all of their speculation, that is the angels, and the pondering about how God was going to redeem the world, they never would have ever thought that God would have done it himself, that he would have left the glories of heaven and come down and live with men and women and children on this earth. What angel would have ever imagined the creator, God, taking on human flesh and being made, as the psalmist said, a little lower than the angels? That must have been mind-blowing for them that God would lower himself to come down among all of these people on earth who were broken and tattered and hurting and sinful. But that's where he came. He came for me. That's why he came. You know, God continues to display his wisdom in and through the body of Christ, the church. That's you and me. The Apostle Paul picks up this point in Ephesians. He says something. He says that we, the church, are now the place where God reveals his wonderful counsel. Think about what the church is this thing we call the body of Christ. We're an unlikely bunch, but God shows up in us. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, the church, the body of Christ, 
in all of our beautiful oddness is a living testimony to the wonderful counselor who has put this whole thing together in a way that surprises us all. Every saving encounter with Christ, every act of conversion is what C.S. Lewis calls a case of being surprised by joy. Were you surprised by joy when the Lord showed up in your life? Were you surprised by joy when, when Jesus says, I love you, I love you just like you are, and I'm going to embrace you. Will you receive my forgiveness? Oh my, what a joy that was. You see, when you come to Christ, you meet the wonderful counselor and you learn about his miraculous plans for your life. It didn't, shock, it didn't stop there. Do you know that the moment that you were saved, it was only the beginning. When God showed up first in your life, that was just the beginning. He was going to do some great things in and through your life. Not just at first when you first meet Jesus, but as you learn to walk with him and you discover that he is indeed the wonderful counselor as he speaks to your heart about matters and he reveals to you things that you never knew before about life and about life eternal. His plans are always perfect. But they're always gracious. And they're good. And they're full of joy and surprise. Is it any wonder that one who truly walks with Jesus has joy in their heart because of who he is? That he is a wonderful counselor, that he speaks to us in our journey through life. There is strength when we have Jesus. Strength for what? Strength in our weakness. When we feel weak, we're made strong. How about when we're broken? He brings blessing. How about when we need to be humbled? He does that for us. When we're afflicted, he brings comfort, even life in the midst of death, all because of Jesus, the wonderful counselor. Amen. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Thank you, God, for the Wonderful Counselor that your Son is. Thank you that you came down here and you lived among us that you were born as a babe in a manger, taking upon yourself humanity, knowing what it's like to live in this world of sin, yet without sin. Knowing every heartache that we have and then being able to bring to our hearts solace, and love, and compassion, and salvation. That's who this wonderful counselor is. I would ask you this morning, do you know him? Have you met this wonderful counselor? Have you met this one that wants to plat his life with your life? So that you know that you have him so that you know that you have eternal life to look forward to 
and between now and then that you walk with the wonderful counselor who gives you guidance and direction for every day. Father, we ask you this morning that you would convict our hearts of those things, Lord, that we need to confess to you, those things, Father, that we need to thank you for, those things, Father, that we need to acknowledge our whole dependence upon. Thank you, Lord, that you came. Thank you, Father, that you lived your life free of sin, but yet taking upon yourself hurt and pain and anguish and agony and all of those things that we deal with in life. Thank you, Father, for leading us along the way. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for salvation. We thank you for the light that you brought into the darkness of our lives when you showed up. And so if there's a single person here today that needs to receive you as Lord and Savior, may this day be their day. May they realize that only you can forgive sin. Lord, you told us that you were the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through you. And so, Lord, today, I pray that if there's one here that needs to do that, that they would allow you to be their Savior. Father, for others, perhaps, who are looking for church home, Lord, may today be their day to come and unite with us to plant their lives in service here. Lord, there may be some others who just need to come around this altar and pray. Lord, it's always open for that. And so, Lord, during these moments of invitation, May we do what you want us to do. And we'll thank you for it. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand together. As we sing, the Lord's leading me to make a decision today. <laughs>